microphone, not because I think I need it, but because we are recording this presentation for your use and for the use of parents who weren't able to make it here tonight. Welcome, thank you so much for coming on such a cold evening. My name is Cindy Assini, and I am the supervisor of social studies and REACH here at Hillsborough Township Public Schools. And we're very happy to be able to offer you this presentation tonight, um, primarily for parents of second grade students this year. However, if you are here and you have a child who's not in second grade, we hope that you will get a lot of great information as well. So tonight we have three goals. The first goal is to talk a little bit about gifted education here in Hillsborough and why we think it's so important. The second goal is for you to hear from an expert in gifted and talented education, Dr. Joan Rudiman, who's here joining us. And I'll introduce more about her when we get to her portion of this evening. And then the third part and third goal of tonight is to tell you about the COGAT testing that's gonna be going on in second grade classrooms in February. Those are our goals for the evening. I wanted to preface any other remarks that I have with the Hillsborough mission statement. So as you can see, the mission statement of Hillsborough focuses on educating all of our kids so that we have great leaders for tomorrow. And I, I put the emphasis up there because when we're talking about gifted and talented students, we really are interested here in Hillsborough in providing them with an outstanding experience. So we'll talk about our program and also about how we identify students for that program. As far as the board policy, I wanted to also begin with this because this governs the decisions that I make as a supervisor and governs the program that we've developed here in Hillsborough. So I added some emphasis to the board policy so that we can really focus on how we select and provide services to gifted and talented kids here. So if you'll note the, in the board policy, we're looking for exceptionally able students. It could be in one content area or multiple content areas. Usually a child is more talented in, in some areas than others, gifted or otherwise. So we're looking for exceptionally able students. We're looking for students who, when compared to their peers, need additional services besides the regular education classroom. So if you look at the end of it, require modification, I bolded that term because our teachers in Hillsborough do a great job of differentiating for all different levels of students within the regular classroom. So when we're selecting kids for this program, we're really looking for kids who require those additional modifications. And to achieve their full potential, need something different than just what's in the regular education classroom. So again, what is that difference between a child who's doing great in school and a child who would qualify for our gifted and talented program. Maybe one in the same and it may not. So I distilled a little bit of research from the Gifted Child Quarterly to go through some characteristics of children that you might consider um, as gifted. So I usually avoid putting this many words on a PowerPoint slide, but I did it because there's two lists of characteristics that I want you to consider, and I think that they're best considered side by side. So I'll give you a second to look at this list, but as you start looking at it, you'll notice that these are the characteristics of basically every teacher and parent's dream. So the child is working hard, they're loving school, they're excited to, to do their best in all of their classes, and they're getting great results in terms of their assessments, so they're really on track, they're where they need to be. So you might think, here's the list of gifted. That's one of the things that we're gonna focus on tonight. Not necessarily. So we can refer to these students as the bright children. If you've ever heard our superintendent of schools, Dr. Jordan Schiff, speak about the difference between children who are doing very well and, and children who may qualify for the program, he talks about those bright, shiny apples and how they do everything that we ask them to and they excel and they may be doing excellently in school but may not qualify for our REACH program. So when you compare it to this list here, um, you'll see some differences and you'll see that this list here has some different connotations, some more mixed connotations potentially and these are some of the characteristics that come out in the research about gifted children. Maybe they have silly ideas. Maybe they get really strong opinions. 
Um, you might be at a parent-teacher conference and hear something like, um, you know, your, your child strays from the topic of instruction. Something like that might be a cue. I see some of you smiling in the audience. That might be a cue that you may have a gifted child. So we're looking to meet the needs of all of our children. Some are met in the classroom, and then some we identify as, as really needing something else. So an easy way to remember this, I'm stealing this from another presenter. If you're familiar with The Simpsons, you of course know the character of Lisa, who does everything asked of her. She's held up as a model of great behavior and the perfect citizen. So she's your bright, shiny apple if you're teaching in The Simpsons. Then you have Bart. So Bart, on the other hand, for those of you who might not watch The Simpsons that often, gets in trouble all the time is always pushing his teachers and pushing the buttons and not doing what's expected, is following his interests, the type of kid that might be doing science experiments in the basement that you're worried about, that type of kid. So it's just a fun way to think about the difference between, uh, that we're looking for as educators in terms of the kids who are doing really well, the bright shiny apples, and the kids who may need additional services from our gifted and talented. So let's talk a little bit about the instructional implications comparing the bright child and the gifted child. So as far as bright children go, they learn quickly in class. It may take them something like six or eight repetitions to learn something. But if you look on the gifted side, you're going to see a lot more questioning, a lot more wanting details and elaborating on things that they're learning. And this is one of the ones that really stands out to me. So while your average student who's doing very well might need six to eight repetitions of a topic to really master it. Your gifted child may only need one or two. And they may be learning a lot of things or hearing a lot of things in their class that they already know. I was talking with a first grade teacher today who has a child who, you know, she said, you know, when I was doing, I was just introducing the whole idea of having a government and this, this child was telling me all about the three branches and the balance of powers between the executive, judicial, and legislature legislative. So, um, you know, you may have a kid who doesn't even need to hear things, who um, already knows, for example. So, um, your gifted children are going to be, um, tend to be more cr on the creative side. Um, they want to try new ideas, try a project, and they'll take a project that they're interested in and they'll see it to fruition. When they guess about things, they tend to be accurate. So again, when, when teachers are teaching in a class of 25 children, for example, if you have one child or two chi children who get everything super quickly, it's a, ch it's a real challenge to meet the needs of that child in the regular education setting, which is why we developed the REACH program here at Hillsboro. Going back to the board policy after this little introduction about some of the research about gifted children, it may start to make more sense. And we really care about meeting the needs of, of all of our children, and our, including our gifted children here. So we've developed the REACH program. In a moment, I'll get into a little bit more about the program. But I, I wanted to touch on all the things, or some of the things at least, that Hillsborough is doing to meet the needs of gifted and talented students. So for example, we had Dr. Ruddeman present very similar information to our teachers, so that our teachers are looking for these behaviors in their classroom and well equipped to handle them. We have been making an effort to communicate with parents so that they're aware of this information. We ran a certificate program where educators at Hillsborough had the opportunity to take classes through Rutgers University, and we had about 15 staff members in district complete a certificate in gifted education which is very rare to have that number of educators in one district who have gone through that level of training in gifted and talented education. Some of them are here with us tonight, and I'll introduce them um, later on so you can seek them out at the end of the presentation if you have any questions. But it just really is a testament to the dedication of the educators here in Hillsboro that not only some of our gifted and talented teachers did that certificate program, but some regular classroom teachers did it as well, just because they wanted to be able to really differentiate for the students in their class and meet the needs of those high ability learners. So as far as REACH, some of you may be familiar with the program because your child is having meetings in their classroom with a REACH teacher at the K to two level. So 
at that level, in grades one and two specifically, it's a push-in program where the teachers are working on the same skills that the whole program focuses on, creativity and critical thinking, but it's in the classroom one day out of the six-day cycle. In addition to that push-in at the grades one and two, for grades K to four, our teachers in the REACH program are working with the regular education teachers to differentiate and make sure that they're meeting the needs of all the learners in the teachers' classrooms. At the third and fourth grade level, the program's a pull-out program where the students will meet with the REACH teacher usually once um, during the six-day cycle, but it depends on the school. It's all for the same amount of time, depending on the, on the exact schedule of the school. And the teachers will be working with the students in a small group setting. So there's, there's an academic component in terms of creative projects and critical thinking skills. There's also the socio-emotional component that the teachers work on in terms of increasing self-awareness among children, decision-making ability, and their thinking skills. So the program has multiple different components that are all designed according to best practices in gifted and talented education. At this point, I'm going to introduce Dr. Ruddeman. I do want to read about Dr. Ruddeman because there's so much to say about her that I don't want to miss anything. Dr. Joan Ruddeman currently serves as the K-12 Gifted and Talented Resource Specialist in the West Windsor Plainsboro School District. Dr. Ruddeman is quite active in the field of gifted education. She's been an adjunct professor in the Graduate Program for Gifted Education at Rutgers University, and she's an active member of the New Jersey Association for Gifted Children, where she serves in a variety of leadership roles. In 2005, the New Jersey Association of Gifted Children selected Dr. Ruddeman as its Educator of the Year. Dr. Ruddeman earned her doctorate in curriculum and teaching from Teachers College of Columbia University. Dr. Ruddeman has become a friend of Hillsborough Schools and she assisted us with our program evaluation. She also presented on the topic of gifted education to the Community Partnership Network last year as well as Hillsborough Teachers. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Joan Ruddeman. Moment, I have, a, I have to get a tech. Okay. <clears throat> I am, um, if you've ever heard the expression, a, a digital immigrant and a digital native. Your children are digital natives. Um, I am a digital immigrant. I have my green card, but I'm afraid they're going to take it away from me if I don't like step it up. So, technology is uh, my friend, and we um, coexist happily. But I always have to get a, a, a little bit of a, a tech update. What I want to do tonight is to clarify some of the uh, concepts of G&T and disabuse you of some maybe ideas that you have and uh, raise your awareness a bit. Um, this is the definition from 1972 Marlin Report that uh, is the same definition that Hillsborough uses which is the same definition of gifted that the state of New Jersey uses. And if you note, it says that it's, uh, it really is looking at students in relationship to their peer group, that these are students that are extraordinary, beyond ordinary, in one or more areas, not all areas, but in one or more areas with their peer group. The um, theory and the leader in gifted education that I have followed even before I knew who he was, my philosophy aligned with Joe's philosophy. Uh, Dr. Joe Renzulli has been in the field of gifted education for well over 40 years. He is at the University of Connecticut at the Nag School of Gifted. Um, he and his wife Sally Reese are, are really leading researchers and authorities in the field of gifted education. I have to tell you that when Joe came on board 40 years ago, um, he was vilified for his ideas in gifted education. What Joe really believes is that it's not about giftedness and in, from the oh, early 20th century, century onward until probably the 1970s, 1980s, with the advent of multiple intelligence theory, IQ was really the measure of gifted. And if you had a test score of 130, 135 or above, on the Weschler or the um, Stanford Binet IQ test, you were gifted. 
Um, the problem with that is there's a lot of different ways of being smart. Um, we know people that are brilliant designers wouldn't necessarily do well with a paper and pencil test, the IQ test that is testing essentially reading, writing, and some logic ability. So uh, Joe really expanded our understanding and our awareness, and it's a much more egalitarian way of, of looking at gifted, and it also is a way to get to the students, all the students that we need to see. Joe talks about gifted behavior, which is the intersection of high ability, that's pretty easy to find. I mean, we can see high ability in kids' scores in school and how well they do and their vocabulary level and their uh, precocity in reading. Um, but what do they do with that high ability? And that's where creativity comes in. This is where you have kids that ask interesting questions or have passions for unusual topics and just can't get enough of, to read enough about it. The third component, the third ring in his three ring theory is task commitment. How much do they want to invest in what they're interested in? And this is, becomes really key to um, what we attempt to offer to kids, opportunities that we offer to students. How much do they want to invest, that intrinsic motivation? So it's high ability, creativity, and task commitment. We've talked about the bright child. Joe calls this the schoolhouse gifted child. Now, parents, you're looking at that list of the Lisas of the world. You should be so blessed to have a child like that in your home. They're always gonna like school. They're always gonna love their teacher. They're always gonna be happy to do their homework. They're going to do well with whatever they take. They're gonna get into the college of their choice. They're gonna do really well in life. They're very adjusted, happy people and they're achievers. They might not necessarily be gifted. Does that, is that a problem? I don't see that as a problem. I think that's pretty wonderful. Joe calls this schoolhouse gifted. These are kids that are really concerned about pleasing the teacher, doing well, getting the good grades, okay? Kids that are gifted are intrinsically, highly intrinsically motivated. They have interests that often fall outside of the curriculum. They are um, driven by their own passions. They, if it's something, if they, they hit on something in the classroom that is real interesting to them, they'll do really well. And then the next unit in the social studies class or the science class is not interesting to him, to they don't, he doesn't put it, produce and do well. These are the kids that drive us crazy. And you're like, well, you got all A's, you know, on that last chapter test. And now, like, you're getting C's. And the, and the kid's response is, eh, not interesting to me. That's frustrating. They don't necessarily, I call it playing the school game. They don't play the game particularly effectively, um, which creates problems. Because we all know that they do need to do well in school. They do need to, to get good grades in order to um, get to the college that they want and achieve. Some of the kids that, that are wildly, widely um, intrinsically motivated in an area that doesn't connect to school will often find their way in life and do really well in life. Problem is, they have to survive school first. Okay. All right, gifted education should involve. I'm Um, gifted education should involve rigorous pace, um, the one, in, one or two repetitions instead of five or six repetitions. These kids move really fast. They think really fast. Um, before the, the um, question is even posed, it's like on Jeopardy, ding, ding, ding. Like, you don't even know what the question is yet. They've anticipated it, often anticipated correctly. Um, they're, they can drive you crazy, you know, as you're driving along in the car and they answer the questions before you ever ask them and they all, they seem to read your mind, you know, and then they tell you what you're thinking. They're not teenagers yet, just wait. Some element of student choice. These are the kids that are not real compliant with doing what the teacher wants them to do. They want to do it their way. So the teacher says, okay, the project is going to be a poster. 
This kid says, can it be round? Can it be three-dimensional? Right? Can I, you know, can I do it in a PowerPoint instead? One, they, they need their own choice with reading. They want to read things that they choose to read. Um, helping them learn to play the school game, to learn some compliance, is really critical in working with these kids. But they're not necessarily easy. And they have to have a meaningful purpose. Pace, choice, and purpose. I distilled this from a lot of research that I've done over the years. And in working with teachers of gifted kids, it comes down to those three elements. They work at a real fast pace. This is why we differentiate. They need um, to have a choice. Don't just tell them what to do and how to do it. Give them a framework. Show them, you know, this is the end product that we, that we need. Give them room to do it in the way they choose to do it. It's not whether you're going to finish it or not. It's how they finish it that they will reach a product. And then the last part is real interesting. Um, they'll work very hard for something that's meaningful to them. But this need for authentic purpose. In education, I date myself, but probably 20 years ago, the big buzzword in education was authentic assessment. And people were like, what does that mean? Well, authentic assessment is not just a grade from one teacher. It would be review from a panel. It would be what National History Day is about, or any contests that the kids do. Um, one reason why gifted kids really love contests, because it's not about winning the award. It might be for you parents, and winning the award's important. For the kid, it's not about winning the award. It's about testing themselves against a wider audience. I'm good. How good am I really? This is why kids, when they start to apply to colleges, really stretch. Could I make it into Princeton? Could I get into Yale? You know, am I good enough for Lehigh's engineering program? You know, they, they really want some authentic um, purpose and authentic assessment for what they do. All gifted education requires research skills, problem solving and analysis skills, and communication skills. I want you to look at this slide really carefully and cross-check it against the REACH program. Because the REACH program is embedded in your social studies curriculum, but it could be embedded anywhere. And Hillsborough made that decision a long time ago to put it into social studies, and that's great, because there's a lot of critical thinking and analysis in social studies and historical thinking. But it's the, the nature of the REACH program is that kids have an opportunity to research, find answers instead of just answers being given to them. They have the opportunity to um, analyze and critically think and problem solve, which historians are doing all the time, as well as communication. And the communication piece is twofold. Communicate with each other, communicating with the teacher, you know, the ability to express ideas, but also communicating a product out to a wider audience. Okay? And again, the National History Day project, um, projects that kids do and that Hillsborough is getting involved in um, relates to all of this. Okay, so the next piece that I'm going to do is characteristics of gifted, and it's based on a lot of research, and this is just some of it, but I threw that screen up there because all researchers in chapter two give you all their research so that we look credible. So this isn't just coming from me, it's coming from a whole bunch of people. You've seen this, the idea that um, there are positive and negative aspects of gifted behavior. They're the, the Lisa and the Bart syndrome. Okay, so we have um, kids that are very, learn very quickly, they're rapid readers, they um, have high concentration and long attention spans, they're inquisitive, they ask questions. All those things are great and are, are going to help them to be really good students in school. But at the same time, highly gifted people often have uneven mental development. They may be really smart in one, on one area and not as quick to develop in another. You can have kids that are really brilliant little math whizzes in first grade, but they are not particularly strong readers or writers. You might have kids that are terrific readers and writers, but they struggle with math. And you're like, how is that possible? Because they're so smart. Well, they're, they are. 
And eventually, they're going to do fine with math, or if they're writers and, and they're weak in first grade, that will develop. But it's not as, as even as we would want it to be. Um, written in caps is perfectionism. This is a major problem with highly gifted people. Um, it really raises its head um, in middle school. I, I spent most of my career with middle school students. And the idea that um, these kids are used to being smart, they're used to getting answers very quickly, being the best in the class, they don't necessarily have to work real hard. They get to middle school and they start to face some challenges and the other kids start to mature and catch up with them. And they find that, that they're not necessarily the best at everything. And for some kids, they, they really crash with, with that. Perfectionism, the kid that um, is doing her homework and it's not perfect and she scratches it out and she's erasing until she raises a hole in the paper. Or the kid that goes into a meltdown because it's not perfect, it's not, it's not exactly the way it's supposed to be. They color outside the line and, you know, and you're like, what's the big deal, you know? Perfectionism is a, a real challenge for, for these people, um, lifelong challenge. Often they have self-doubt and poor image. Um, that we, one of the things that we are really concerned about is the social emotional needs of gifted kids and I'll tell, talk more about that in a moment. Okay, so there's different aspects of giftedness and we'll start with the, the one that we're most interested in which is cognition. This is the way the brain works and how they learn. Um, I'm going to show you um, this in what is, is considered, I think, a word wall. Um, this was not developed by me. The thoughts were there, but I had a 25-year-old looking over my shoulder as I was developing the PowerPoint, and everything was in nice, neat rows and all in black and white. And Sarah said, Joni, you could do this in such a more interesting way. And I said, Sarah, really, how would you do it? And she said, well, you could do a word wall or a tweet. Well, I've never tweeted. I have no idea. But the idea with tweets is if something's really big, it's generalizable. It's something that is, is real typical. If it's smaller, it's a reality, but it's not all the time reality. Got it? OK, made sense to me. So when we have cognition, gifted people, you can bet, writ large, they have original and unusual and creative ideas. And interestingly, they connect seemingly unusual ideas together. So you're having a conversation at dinner and the kid goes off on polar bears and somehow it connects to what's going on in Syria. And you're like, oh, how about that? They have a superior ability to reason and generalize and problem solve. They have sometimes, now see it's writ a little bit smaller, vivid and rich imaginations, extensive vocabulary, fascinated, fascination with words, again, writ a little smaller, so not always. Sometimes they learn things rapidly, excellent long-term memory, sometimes with cognition, Grasp mathematical scientific concepts readily and advanced comprehension of mathematical concepts. Sometimes, not always. Avid readers, some gifted people are avid readers, not always. Complex and deep thinkers and abstract thinkers. Minds run on multiple tracks at the same time, a fast thinker. Um, some of these aspects occur some of the time in some subject areas, but not all of the time, okay? So you'll see flashes of it. For cognition, what for sure you're gonna see is that they're original thinkers and they make interesting um, connections. Perception and emotion. These kids are highly sensitive. Um, they're like little moral philosophers. These are the kids you don't want watching the evening news. They're really worried with what's going on in Lebanon. Um, they want to go out and collect blankets and, and mail them to the people that have been in the tsunami, right? Um, you, you really have to protect them from the real ugliness of the world because they internalize it so deeply. They ask why. One of my favorite stories about a young man um, who was at that point in kindergarten and the district thought, this was not your district, nor was it mine, but the district he was in um, had him classified and thought that he had learning disabilities. The little first, he was a little um, kindergartner at the time. 
And his dad, who was an educator with me at the time, would tell me stories about this kid, um, Charlie, we'll call him Charlie. And there, there was an older brother who was autistic. And this Charlie, when he was about four years old, his dad was trying to help him understand why the older brother reacted to them and interacted with them. And Charlie said, oh, dad, I understand. Liam's brain is allergic to us. If that's not the best definition of autism I have ever heard, Liam's brain is allergic to us. The kid was four years old. Had a quirky sense of humor. I mean, just really an interesting character. And I, so I said to the dad, you got to get him tested because I think he's really, really smart. He's not, he's not, <laughs> the problem is not that he can't learn. The problem is that he won't learn. And that was, he's still a, a, a reluctant and difficult character. Highly sensitive, very um, emotionally attuned to what's going on around them. Sometimes, and this is Dabrowski's work, sometimes sensitive to clothing. Um, I don't know if you know that Cindy is a graduate of Princeton, and her husband's a graduate of Princeton. So um, she's had a lot of experience living with some really wild and smart and quirky people. And one is her husband. And she was saying, you know, I, I was noting this, and my husband will not wear blue jeans. They won't. Do you watch The Big Bang Theory? Oh, Sheldon. He's classic. I love that show. I, got, I, I watch it literally. It's like a religious experience. They're my tribe. I, whoever is writing that show gets it absolutely right. The, the sensitivity, the, the inability to communicate well, Sheldon's inability to understand how to relate socially, um, and watch what he wears, you know, and the kind of, and where he has to sit. I have to sit here because this is where the air hits me just perfectly. Like, really? But it matters. So Cindy was saying, oh yeah, it matters. Highly sensitive. So emotionally sensitive, but also a physical sensitivity. They won't like, they don't like tags on their clothing, you know, and you have to cut the tags out. And then you have to pick out all the like residue of the threads because they itch. Surprisingly, um, gifted people have really interesting senses of humor. They crack themselves up. Sometimes they crack us up. Most of the time, we don't really get it. Um, one of the coolest dissertations when I was at um, Columbia was a young woman who was um, a preschool teacher in New York at a, a school for the gifted. Only in New York City do they know they're gifted before birth. Okay. <laughs> So the kids were in a school, for, a preschool, preschool for gifted kids. And she carried around, and this is going back to the 90s, but she carried around a stack of index cards where she wrote down examples of, of what cracked them up. Not what she thought was funny, but what may, they thought was funny. And she did, she, her dissertation was humor in gifted preschoolers. They're very perceptive. Notice all of these are writ large. They're very perceptive. They have a keen sense of observation, um, noting often what we do wrong, you know, noting things that are different. Um, you'll say one thing and not follow through with it, and they'll call you on it, okay? Uh, I work with a little boy, Leo, and he's incredibly bright, and he's, he's very specific about time. He's really anal with stuff like this. And he was with a teacher two years ago, who was very structured. And he would call her out because they were, Miss A, it's now math time, and we're 30 seconds beyond time for, thank you, Leo, I know. <laughs> he, he out, like, structured her. It was, it was really amusing to watch. Very passionate, intense feelings. Um, passion is a word and intensity is a word that's often connected with gifted people. Um, a, a, a classic bit from Big Bang Theory, Leonard and Penny. Now Penny's the normal one, right? Okay. And Penny knows how the world works and thank God for Penny because she's like, kind of socialized all the boys across the hall. So Leonard and Penny are having dinner and Leonard's talking about something and he's really excited about it and it's Star Wars or it's whatever. And Penny's like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, like, you're passionate about so many things. And he said, well, 
you're passionate about stuff. And she's like, mm, no, not really. And he says, well, sure you are, Penny. And she thinks and she says, shoes. I'm really passionate about shoes. She's normal. I mean, most people are not that intense. You know, um, it's, and they're hard to live with. Sensitive to small changes in environment, that's a sometimes thing, but that's the Dombrowski thing. Um, sometimes introverted, even people that are very seemingly extroverted. Robin Williams, are you watching his new show? Um, I watch it just to see Robin Williams because he is just like a maniac brilliant person. Um, though he appears to be an extreme extrovert, he is really introverted and needs time by himself to decompress. Again, Big Bang Theory. There was a, a, a great um, program uh, skit that they did with Sheldon disappeared every day at 2.20, precisely at 2.20. And uh, Wolovitz and Howard, d d Howard and uh, Kuthrapali, where does he go and what does he do? So they, they tracked him to a basement room that was locked. They picked the lock, they went inside, there's a table and a blackboard with the number 42 on it. And they're trying to figure out, like, what, what's he thinking about? What's he doing? Blah, blah, blah. And so they set up a camera, and of course Sheldon knows it's there, and he, like, blows up the room or something. And they're, oh, my God, they killed himself. Well, when they come in, he chastises them. And it's, a, it's so brilliantly done. And he says, you don't understand how hard it is to be me. And I need time every day all by myself just to decompress because all my life I have to fit myself into your world, which is very much not my world. And so they were chastised and apologetic and they leave. And he pulls out and he's, he's bouncing a, a paddle ball. And, it, and 42 was the maximum he'd ever gotten up on the, power, the paddle ball. It was, it was just great. That introverted, that need to be alone. Think what we do to kids in school. They are never alone. Okay, and particularly in elementary school, they always are working in groups and they're always with each other and, you know, they have to play nicely in the sandbox. It gets worse when they get to middle school when everything is so social. Um, I tease my kids, you know, like, go into the cafeteria and sit at a table by yourself and read a book and just count how many seconds it takes to have 42 adults around you. Honey, are you okay? Do you feel all right? Do you have any friends? Are you new to the school? I can find, do you want to talk to the counselor? No, I just want to finish my book. Thank you very much. So when I talk to parents of middle schoolers about this, they really understand it because they get the kid who comes home physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted from playing the game all day. And all these kids want to do is just go to their room, leave me alone for a little while, and do that. Just give them time. Kids that play by themselves and we think, is that abnormal? No, no, like, like people can be introverted and not just highly social all the time. But it's kind of a hard one. Aware of things that others are not aware of. They perceive the world differently. Interesting, a tolerance for ambiguity and complexity. We would think that highly brilliant gifted people are very rigid in their thinking and they actually are more inclined to be aware of changes and ambiguities in the world. They can see many sides and consider a problem from multiple perspectives. Really good critical thinkers do that. Childlike sense of wonder. That's part of the passion thing. And again, Big Bang Theory. And the boys get so excited about stuff. You know, they're playing Dungeons and Dragons and whatever. And, but they, they have that childlike sense about them and open it to new experiences, okay? Emotional stability and serenity, huh? Up there, writ very small, let's flash it again, okay, you see it? Writ very small. You wouldn't expect them to be serene or emotionally stable, but if we, educators, and you, parents, are sensitive to what their needs are and we do our jobs well, they really are happy, sensitive, compassionate, empathetic people, and happy in themselves. What motivates them? 
perfectionism. They are motivated for, with high standards for themselves and for everybody around them. And you think about our world and how dysfunctional the leaders of our world are and how frustrating that would be for people of this ilk. Really difficult for them to deal with. Really curious and a desire to know. They're motivated um, by what drives them. Look at this one. Very independent, autonomous, and less motivated by rewards. Grades on a report card are a reward. The dollar or the $10 or whatever the going rate this is now for an A, those are rewards. Praise is a reward. Highly gifted people are not motivated by that which really makes them difficult to teach in school because the great motivator for teachers is you better pay attention, there's going to be a test on this, you know, you're going to fail the test. And a gifted kid says, screw it, I don't care, fail the test. Doesn't matter to me, not interesting to me. But it counts, it's important, not important to me. So they have to have, remember that, that intrinsic motivation, that um, authentic assessment, they have to have something that's relevant for them. I find that my kids, the really, really bright kids when they get to high school, play the game very well because it's a means to an end. And I'll tell you where I see it the most is in AP classes. Because AP classes are not particularly interesting. It's all about running through a curriculum. Cindy can speak to this even better than I can because this is her field. But AP courses are a whole bunch of curriculum and you gotta get to it in order to take a test, in order to get a grade to say to colleges, I'm really good in French 4, or I'm really good in um, physics, or whatever it is. Highly gifted kids will play that game because they've been told, you won't have to take this course again. You can get to college and you can take something that is really interesting to you and not take that. Unless, of course, you're my son, Jake, who also went to Princeton and had a whole bunch of AP credits. And Princeton said to him in his sophomore year, you can take a whole semester off. His father, who's paying the tuition, was like, oh my gosh. And Jake was like, why would I want to do that? I'm at Princeton. I'll just take different courses. OK, honey, we'll keep paying your tuition. That's OK. <laughs> All right? <laughs> but there's that, 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 that relevance, that motivation real hard for sometimes little, very, very bright little kids to understand, really difficult for middle schoolers who are already just reluctant to be cooperative about anything. <laughs> um, they're seekers of truth. They look for patterns and meaning in life. The, the moral philosopher again. They really love taking a challenge and that, that pensions for risk. I'm concerned about this one because if we don't give them the academic risk or the extracurricular fun that's going to challenge them, the contest, the, the striving to see how good they can be, they'll look for, they'll satisfy that risk taking sensation elsewhere. Shoplifting, illicit drugs, just being bad. That's a real concern. So making sure that we do a good job for them in school and make sure that um, they're, they're emotionally satisfied is, is important. They, these are the moral philosophers outraged at moral injustices. Um, <laughs> Cindy and I were chatting and it didn't surprise me that she was at the Woodrow Wilson School. She wasn't in the history department. She was in policy making and she wants to save the world. Well, there you go, you know, I get it. Um, the, the, the kids that are outraged and um, will argue the point that something can be illegal and criminal, and they're not necessarily the same thing. You can break a law that is a criminal, that the law itself is criminal, and then it's morally justified. They'll wrap you in Gordian knots with their, their philosophical renderings wide range of interests and sometimes overwhelmed by too many interests and too many abilities. Particularly your little ones that where everything comes from. And I, I love science and I love art and I love music and I love karate and I, I love reading and there's just not enough time in the day for them to do all the things that they are passionate about. Strong moral convictions, integrity and honesty is a keynote. Sometimes high drive and what would, what would be the, the trigger? that they would have a high drive. Intrinsic motivation, this woman is saying, absolutely. Is it something that matters to them? 
joys of challenge, sometimes a visionary, loves ideas, loves discussion, sometimes sincere. They kind of learn that. Um, writ small, but again, if we do our, our job well, acceptance of others and acceptance of themselves. What kind of activity? Writ really, really large, lots of activity. Jake is married to Kate, wonderful Kate Callahan, also a Princeton grad. And Kate tells a story that on any road trip, her parents built in time to stop for Kate to run around the car. These are the kids that don't go to sleep at night. You put them to bed at the appropriate time. You go in two hours later. They're lying there in the dark with their eyes wide open. Why aren't you asleep? I'm just thinking. And if you give them a flashlight, they're under the covers reading a book until all hours of the night. High, high energy. Long attention span and concentration on topics that interest them. Teachers are surprised at this one, and it's, it's real big. Note how large it is on our word wall. Teachers are surprised at this, parents are not. But think about it. Where in school, when we're, when we're doing school the way it has to be done, do we ever really stop and dig down for a sustained period of time? This is really interesting, a kid's thinking, oh, time's up, we're moving on. Okay, this is a great chapter in social studies. Oh, chapter's over, we're moving on to a new topic. Where do they get that sustained and passionate interest where they work for long periods of time? At home. So you see it, you know, this is the kid where you're calling them for lunch at 11 o'clock. I'm almost done, you know, you call them at 12. I'm almost done. At two o'clock, they wander down for lunch. They finally have finished what they needed to finish. Um, these are people that will work on manic schedules, like 48 hours. Do you know people like that? Adult workers. A lot of tech people, a lot of really smart people in technology, and they keep really weird hours. They get into a job and they just keep at it until they're satisfied that they're at a stopping point or that it's done, that, that manic kind of energy. Can't stop weak, uh, thinking and they work themselves to a frazzle. These are people that need time. This is the um, being introverted thing. They need time for solitude and contemplation. Again, something we don't do real well in school. We don't take time to just stop and reflect, you know, because our average kid, yeah, I thought about it, let's go, <laughs> you know? So this is the thing that they'll do at home with you, parents, that contemplation, that time to think. Spontaneous, right? And then social relations. They question authority and ask embarrassing questions, very large. Um, Cindy was telling me her husband got tossed out of school. Be, well, he, I guess he was removed from school when his parents realized that the teacher was unhappy with him. This is when he was like in first grade. Because he asked inappropriate questions, like why? And I, I just chuckled because this is Kate Callahan, my daughter-in-law's story. She got tossed out of CCD, which for those who are not Catholic is the Catholic instruction for little kids. And she was six years old and the, the lay teacher, God bless her, this is Georgia. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? And that the lay teacher is, is overwhelmed by this little mouthy girl that keeps saying, why? Illogical, makes no sense. Is there a scientific principle behind that? and called in her parents and said, Kate is not allowed to come to CCD. Yeah. So finally her older sister, Colleen's like 12 years older, was so distressed that she made sure that Kate finished all of her, her um, requirements and baptism and got her confirmed and all of that. So Kate has, has come, it was, Kate was a resting Catholic. This was a joke in the family and, and uh, she was a recovering. That was the term. She was a recovering Catholic, and our priest said, all Catholics are recovering. So, <laughs> but she's, she's fine. Questioning authority, asking embarrassing questions, little Leo telling Miss A what time the schedule is, you know, how to do things. You have a, a word spelled wrong there. You have to have a, a really, a good teacher that likes these kind of people, because not everybody likes them. You know, they're, they can be difficult. Um, these are kids that feel different and out of step, sense of alienation and loneliness. This kicks in mm, strongly by fourth grade. 
and they, they realize that they get things faster than other kids, that they understand. Sometimes they understand things that their teachers don't understand, and they're starting to feel really different. I'll give you a story about one of the brilliant geniuses of the 20th century, Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs at 13, um, the family has moved to a new neighborhood because Steve Jobs um, got thrown out of his school and frankly said to his parents, I'm not going back. I don't care to please anybody there. It had pretty much offended everyone, including the principal. So his parents, who were just really hard blue collar working people, sold their house, mortgaged to a hill in a much better neighborhood that had good schools, which happened to be Silicon Valley. So they're now surrounded by engineers and PhDs and very bright people. And so um, one of his good buddies down the street's dad was some kind of physicist. And he was running an experiment one day just to kind of entertain the kids. And Steve Jobs was fascinated by this. So he goes home and explains it to his dad. Now his father, Steve Jobs, you know, was adopted. So his father was, I don't believe a high school graduate. He was a mechanic but he was um, aesthetically um, just did brilliant, beautiful work. Steve Jobs' aesthetics with his computers came from his father, um, his adoptive father. The, the Mac is as beautiful inside aesthetically as it is outside. His obsession for, for beauty came and perfection in construction came from his father. So his father's not a dumb guy, just uneducated and a, a worker. So Steve's explaining this, this experiment to his father, and his father's like, Stevie, that's, like, that's not possible. Dad, you gotta come see it, you gotta come see it. Father walks down the street, and he's like, wow, that's amazing, as he's watching this thing happen. Steve Jobs tells his biographer, Isaacson, at that moment, I knew I was smarter than my dad. I knew I was a lot smarter than my dad, and it really bothered me. He's 13 years old. Now that's not uncommon with really, really smart kids when they realize, they start to realize how different, how out of step they are with other people. We have to be aware of that. They can be very compassionate. They can feel empathy for others and that want to um, understand. One of the brightest little girls I ever taught, seventh grade, and she was really misplaced in an English class just because of her schedule or whatever. And she took it upon herself to analyze the learning styles of all the kids in the class. This is something that we had done in our PRISM class, we had done together. And so she had everybody in the class identified as what kind of auditory processor, visual learner, you know, the kind of um, multiple intelligences they exhibited. And she finished, remember PACE, she finished everything immediately. And then she would just kind of slide up to a kid and she realized he was an auditory processor and everything was written, so she would read to him. And she'd say, I'll, re I'll read you the directions. I'll read this to you. Teacher had no idea that she was doing this. I mean, she, she probably qualified for a degree in special education by the time she finished seventh grade English, right? And she did it just because she had empathy for these people and because she was going to entertain herself one way or the other. She was just a remarkable, remarkable young woman. So, now that you've seen these interesting characteristics, which in some cases are really negative, look what, in a typical GT, gifted and talented program, what screens kids out of gifted and talented programs. Bored with routine tasks, refusing to do rote homework, difficult to get them to move to another topic, that wanting to drill down and do things deeper, self-critical, impatient with failures, perfectionism, critical of others and of the teacher, often disagreeing vocally with others and the teacher, making jokes or puns at inappropriate times, that quirky sense of humor, emotionally sensitive, may overreact. When they're younger, they cry. When they get a little bit older, they just get belligerent or sarcastic, okay? Um, not interested in details, hands in messy work, unless it's something they're really interested in. It's relevant to them. Refuses to accept authority, non-conforming, stubborn, tends to dominate others. In most, and this is not Hillsboro, and you should be really very grateful for that, in most gifted and talented programs that I've encountered in the state of New Jersey and around the country, and indeed with international experiences I've had with um, 
Future Problem Solving, and History Day. Gifted and talented programs generally are a test score and an interview and parent recommendation and what they get are good school behavior kids. They get the bright shiny apples, they get the leases. And these are kids that do really well in school, but all the quirky, weird, abnormal kind of behaviors get screened out. And those are probably the people that are the profoundly gifted. And they're the ones that drop out. 5% of the dropouts in the country are highly gifted people. How sad is that? These are people that often are visual spatial learners. This is Linda Silverman's work. She's out in Denver. Um, super high IQs, um, not necessarily readers or writers, but they're really good with taking stuff apart, building things, putting things together. They're the ones that become the IT people for computers and architects and builders and designers, right? Don't do necessarily well in school, which is about reading, writing, and arithmetic, okay? So I have real concerns about this. Um, and one reason that I really love Joe Renzulli's idea of gifted behaviors is that we can identify in a much more liberal, egalitarian way and hopefully pick up the people that would otherwise be um, screened out. I imagine here in Hillsborough, you're doing the same thing we're doing in West Windsor Plainsboro, which is attuned, we're very attuned to the 21st century competencies. Um, you need to understand that these come from the real world. This is not something that was dreamed up by your district or the state of New Jersey Department of Education or federal government. This came from a consortium of business people, nonprofits, places like um, Cisco and Apple and IBM and Crayola Crayons and Lego, people in the world that identify these competencies as being necessary for success in our 21st century world, okay? We need kids to be self-directed learners and to be informationally literate, to be able to find answers and to be able to discern bias in answers. We need people that are good communicators, not just with what they produce and send out in the world, but communicating with each other, which is called collaboration. We need people that are practical problem solvers, and ultimately, this makes them good citizens. Okay? The, comp the, the uh, 21st century competencies. Hillsborough's goals and objectives to develop complex, abstract, and higher level co cognitive processes. I want you to cross check this against what I've just been showing, showing you about characteristics of gifted. A goal is to develop problem-solving decision-making abilities, to develop awareness and acceptance of oneself as a unique individual and as a member of society, to increase independence, individuality, and self-direction in learning. If you look at the competencies for the 21st century skills, which is what the world really wants of, of workers and doers, and you look at the goals for the REACH program and for probably it's really beyond just the REACH program. This is the curriculum for Hillsborough. Your kids are really being well served because it's not just about reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's not just about learning the stuff in books and being able to, to put it down on a test. It's really about life skills, big skills. Hillsborough REACH program meets the special needs and interests of identified students by providing instruction that differs in process and rate and depth from the patterns of the regular classroom. So you wonder, you, you, you know, parents want their kids in the REACH program, but Joe Renzulli, put yourself in his mindset, is the, is the REACH program good for your child? You know, um, are they going to miss out on something if they're not in the REACH program? Yeah, they're gonna miss out if they're really identified for it and they don't take advantage of it. But what if we have a kid that's just really a bright, good, shiny apple. They don't want to particularly go deeper. They, don't, they just want to make the poster the way it's supposed to be made, right? Is there anything wrong with that? I mean, those are kids that are going to do well in school, but they're not going to hunger for doing things differently. And the REACH program allows them to do things differently. Intellectual integrity, taking risks, being curious, having that intrinsic motivation. 
Extending students' ability to utilize higher level cognitive processes and to sympathize complex and abstract ideas. This is a cognitive process that people grow into. Smart people get it faster. Um, and I can tell you why, actually. I probably need two hands to do this. But, but think about synapses in your brain and information travels um, through circuitry um, through like wires. Think about a wire. And a, wrapped around this, these axons is myelin. Myelin's like a fatty substance. Some research says that really bright people have thicker myelin. So their, the circuitry is insulated more effectively, which allows the ideas or the, the processes to um, move more quickly. Obviously, I'm not a neuroscientist. I teach middle schoolers. That was the middle school version of some high-level neuroscience thinking. But there, but there are people that think faster, process faster, know things sooner than other people of their same age. So go back to the original definition that bright kids, the gifted kids that are identified are extraordinary in some area beyond their peer group, their age peer group. So if your kid's not in the REACH program, can they get into AP courses when they get to high school? The answer is absolutely. Can they take honor courses when they get to the high school? Absolutely. Are they going to miss out on anything? No, because actually the REACH program curriculum and your social studies curriculum is the same. The REACH curriculum will go deeper, will be more abstract, appropriate to the cognitive development of the kids in that class. So like what's best for the class? This helps kids to develop their self-awareness, their self-esteem, their emotional maturity, constructive peer relationships, Instead of hiding and thinking like Steve Jobs, oh my God, I don't want to tell anybody that I'm smarter than my dad. And he didn't until he was about 21, 22 years old. Did he actually confess that to himself out loud? I'm really smart and I'm smarter than my dad and it's okay. But he was a fully mature man before he could cope with that. How much better for our kids to have some relationships with people who are like-minded peers, who get their jokes, who are following the news, who know where Lebanon is in Syria, and they, they have opinions about this. Think how, think in your own lives as adults, how you gravitate to people who have the same interests as you. Think about your work situations and the people that you have lunch with or the people that you even work with that think like you and have similar interests in kind of think at the same pace. Think about experiences in your life where you have been paired with people in collaborative groups and you don't have anything in common with them and how frustrating that is. So then think about your kids that are a child that is, is thinking faster, has their own passions and interests, is a little quirky, always having to conform with the the, the group, with the, with the norm, okay? I don't think there's anything that's average, but there is something about a mean or a norm. It's really hard for them. And so REACH allows them to be in a position, and this is why it's really cool that it's in social studies, because that's where a lot of discussion happens, a lot of discussion. Um, that's where you can say, but what if? But what, what if the, um, the people at Jamestown riffing on a, a unit they're doing right now. What if the people of Jamestown um, acquiesced to the Native American people and were willing to work with them and serve them? Would that have changed what the outcome of Jamestown? Hmm, think about it. All right. And then the classic line is, discuss among yourselves, right? The teacher actually becomes like a facilitator in the environment instead of the, God bless you, instead of um, a director, uh, like a, a teacher that is making sure that the, the thinking process moves along the way it's supposed to move along in the curriculum. Providing opportunities for in-depth learning in an area of individual interest. Being able to actually pursue something that they're interested in. Now, I'm going to talk about COGAC testing. Cindy's going to come back, and then I'll jump in and give you some, some of my thoughts on COGAC. So, 
Thank you, Dr. Rudderman, for all of that information. As you can imagine, it's quite a challenging task to try to accurately identify the gifted students in our school. And that's one of the reasons why we give the COGAT test. It's not the only test we rely on. But we don't want to miss any children, so we give the test to every second grade child in their classes. And I just want to take a moment, so I don't forget, to mention one of the common misconceptions. Dr. Rudderman did a really nice job of talking about how identification for the REACH program going into third grade does not in any way limit or set up your child for taking classes at other levels as we go on. In fact, in our high school placement process that we're going through right now with our eighth grade students, we do not even consider quali qualifying for the REACH program in that process. There's also the opportunity for your child to qualify for the program every year. So this is not a, a be all end all of your child receiving services in Hillsborough. One of the other misconceptions I wanted to touch on is the idea that if a child gets into reach, that they're somehow better. Or if your child doesn't get into reach, but their best friend does, that their best friend is somehow better. That's absolutely not the case. And we'd really appreciate your help in sharing the district's message that this is a specialized program for a very small group of children. And if a child does not qualify, they could still be doing excellently in school, everything that they want, we want them to be doing, and there's nothing that's wrong with them in any way. So really helping us portray it as a very specialized program for a small group is the best thing you can do in terms of helping children deal with the fact that some children are in the program and others are not. So as far as the COGAT goes, um, there are three parts to the COGAT. How many of you are going through having a second grader for the first time? Could you raise your hand? Okay, and how many of you have had a child go through second grade and have received COGAT scores? Okay, that's helpful to know. Um, I will touch on, on, on both ends. Um, so there are three elements to the COGAT score report you'll get back, a verbal, nonverbal, and quantitative. The nonverbal is your spatial piece. Um, the other two are, are pretty self-explanatory. Um, when you get the scores back, you'll see a national percentile rank, which shows your child compared to all of the other second graders who took the test at that time. They actually norm it by quarter because, as we know, children develop throughout the year. So your child will be compared to all students around the nation who took the test at that time of year. So that'll give you some interesting information. Um, in terms of preparation, I get questions from parents, what can I do to help prepare my child? And really we discourage any type of studying or formal prep preparation for the COGAT because again, we're trying to find kids that need these services, a small group of kids. So it really just should be part of their, the child's normal day as much as possible. So you want them to get rest, you want them to be well fed, like I'm sure you prepare them every single day. In terms of if you want to mention something about the test, we recommend saying something like, there's going to be a test today at school that's going to help your teacher understand you better, so just try your best. Not making a huge deal out of it, just explaining it in those very simple terms. Um, as far as when you get the report back, um, that will happen hopefully at the, end of May, at the end of March, and you'll get a letter from me, either that you're you know, with your child's score report, but also that either your child is not qualified for further screening or they have qualified for, th for further screening. Regardless of their further screening, that score report has some really helpful information for you as a parent. When it comes back, you'll see the score broken down into the three categories, but you'll also get a narrative blurb about your child that will talk about relative strengths and weaknesses. For those of you that have gotten the score report in the past, it may look different at this point because of this narrative piece that has been um, added on. The other piece that is relatively new in the COGAT score report is a URL with a passcode. So the narrative you get will be specific to your child, but when you go online, it will give you more detailed information about general children that fit a similar profile to your child. That can be really helpful because it gives you ideas of how to work with your child at home and how to talk to your child's teacher based on their test results. So I would highly recommend you know, really taking a close look at the score report, looking at the online information, looking at our frequently asked questions on the REACH website, and then if you have questions about the score report to contact me. Um, while the REACH teachers at all the schools are tremendously helpful, um, fielding requests from every second grade parent would be really challenging for them and still be able to do their jobs. So 
So I volunteer to take your, your questions, but we do ask that you look at all the information that we have provided um, to help you understand the report. As far as if your child is identified for further screening, there's a variety of things that we take into account, including a survey that we'll send to you, a survey that will go to your child's teacher. Um, we're really looking at a combination of factors, creativity, achievement test scores, cognitive ability. So we don't use one measure, we use multiple. That's one of the best practices in the research. We also make sure that kids have multiple opportunities. Like I mentioned, we do this COGAT testing in, in second grade. But if your child is nominated by their teacher in, in further grades, and that's something that you can always speak with a teacher about, you know, do you think that this would be appropriate for my child? There's always more opportunities for your child to be identified for needing services in the future. So to sum up for the, for the evening, our goal is to find kids who really need to have this special environment taken out from their mainstream regular education class um, for these services. So our goal, you know, is to do the best for all of our kids here in the district. Before we go on to questions, I want to take a moment to thank all the people who have made this happen this evening. Dr. Ruddeman, Lynn Wolf from our Board of Education office. Um, we have a number of teachers here. Not all of the REACH teachers could be here, but a number are. Um, so I have the teachers from each school. Ms. Leonard at Amsterdam, Ms. Donofsky is here from HES. Mrs. Vinovsky was not able to join us, um, nor was Mrs. Casal, but Mrs. Peterson and Mrs. Lieberman, if you guys could wave. Um, they're back there, and Ms. Donofsky's over there. Um, we also have uh, fifth and sixth grade teachers here, Mrs. Seller and Mrs. Patrick. And we also have a teacher from our certificate program who teaches second grade, Ms. Hannum, back there. So we have a number of staff members who have kindly volunteered to come out tonight to be available for you if you have questions.